Hello, welcome. Let's see here. Sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. All right. So let me get your names down. Give you credit for being here. Um, as I'm doing this, are there any questions? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. All right. Um, if you don't mind, Michael, could you tell me what your last name is, Michael? All right, let's see here, Castro. Sorry for taking so long, everyone. It's a bit of a, a big class, actually, and let's see here. Or just write your names down and figure it out. All right. So we are covering Spanish colonization. And in each topic we do, right, I try to, um, I try to tie it to some type of big uh, historical, the fancy word is historiographical, uh, you know, debate of some sort, et cetera. In the Spanish, it's pretty easy because there's a prevalent one in academia, and that is the black legend, all right? And what the black legend implies, right, is that the Spanish serve as a convenient anti-model for us today. Uh, they, they show us how not to be, uh, that they were ethnocentric, uh, that they were religiously fanatic, uh, that they were uh, intolerant, uh, that their society was very um, hierarchical and, um, inequitable. And so the opposite of, of, of like egalitarianism, everyone on equal footing, uh, democracy, right? The opposite of tolerance. Um, uh, they, they serve as that type of anti-model in the history books, right? So teachers today can look and see and say, okay, see how the Spanish were. We don't want to be that way. And, and we're, 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 uh, we're glad that we're not that way now today, allegedly, right? But to the Spanish, they contended that they were given a bad rap, and they contended why things have to be bad, have to be black, is a whole other can of worms that we can maybe address when we do slavery uh, coming up soon. Uh, but they contended that this was all a black legend about them, uh, about vilifying them as being anomalously out of the ordinary, um, uh, just a, a, a poor colonizer, okay? So we're going to address that issue um, here. What I wanted to do is start off with a brief chronology and some of the terms that we'll throw around and, and some of the, uh, the dialogue or discourse that happens on this topic. If you could see this. So at first, right, we have in 1492, we have the first of four famous expeditions by Cristobal Colon or Christopher Columbus. And um, he landed in the Caribbean, right? Uh, you have uh, by the second, and I have a, a PowerPoint, it's 66 slides. I'm sorry, you guys, but uh, I, I hope that you can still pick and choose and it could be of some help for you. Uh, but um, on the second um, expedition, he was told to go ahead and, and lay, claim, lay claim to land and to Christianize uh, the, um, the Americas. 
So Pope Alexander VI at this time of the Catholic Church happened to have been a Spaniard himself. And um, he is going to, let's see here, put another name in. He is, uh, he's going to give his blessing to the conquest of the Americas and to any pagan lands. And he's going to mandate that the Catholic countries like Spain and Portugal, uh, that they Christianize, that they convert uh, to uh, Christianity and to the Catholic Church, uh, the inhabitants thereof. All right. They're known as the uh, Alexandrian bulls, papal bulls. And one of the famous one was at Tordesillas. The Treaty of Tordesillas was big. So at any rate, you have that going on. And you, you had conflict uh, very quickly uh, brewing in the Caribbean. Uh, Columbus came in and um, made a pact uh, with the Arawaks, uh, A-R-A-W-A-K-S. And with the Arawaks, he became a military um, ally to them against the feared Caribs that the Caribbean is named after, uh, C-A-R-I-B-S. And so uh, he took advantage of that in, in claiming land, a small island in the Bahamas that he named San Salvador, a uh, holy savior. And so at any rate, uh, he left 50 men at Fort Navidad, like Christmas, um, there. And when he came back for his second expedition, on his second expedition, uh, he had found that they had been uh, killed. And so uh, the, the, uh, the tribal leader, the cacique, as they were called, C-A-C-I-Q-U-E, uh, the cacique uh, claimed he feigned ignorance of what had happened, uh, blamed it on their enemies. And then he was found with a gunshot wound in his leg that he was trying to hide. And they found that they, that they had been killed by the Arawak, by their own allies. And the Arawak contended that the Spanish soldiers were had been uh, raping Arawak women. And so um, from there, you also have uh, drama with his own men. Uh, some of his own men went off uh, on their own without his permission. Uh, they engaged in a mutiny on at least one occasion, and he had those uh, responsible for it executed in front of all his other men. Uh, some of the men that went off went to the island of Puerto Rico, uh, where they found gold, and that stirred up trouble with the Taino, T-A-I-N-O, uh, Native American tribe. And so it didn't take long for them to go to war with the Taino. So they'd already declared war against the Caribs when they landed. And then they, uh, from the Fort Navidad episode, they went to war with the Arawak and it didn't take long to fight against the Taino as well. So it didn't take long for the Spaniards to be at war uh, with all three of the, the major tribes of the Caribbean. And so, uh, yeah, so you have that. And then in 1502, uh, the, the Spaniards made a uh, kind of a, a a directive to uh, have a focal point, a geographical focal point from which they were going to uh, construct a, a Spanish American administration. And they did it on the island that is shared by the Dominican Republic in Haiti. Uh, and they named it um, Española after España. Uh, so we usually uh, anglicize it and, and pronunciate it Hispaniola, uh, H I S P A N. I-O-L-A. And so from there, they, they uh, began the first uh, kind of hierarchical administration, if you will. So at the, at the top, ostensibly right, were the, the Pope and the vicar, the representative of God as a formerly Catholic country of Spain. Uh, although there was not one Spain yet, uh, as you might know, uh, you know, you have uh, Aragon and Castile, um, you have uh, Navarre, and um, uh, several, uh, several uh, states that, that, that constituted what we would call Spain um, at this time. And, but two of the states uh, were beginning to, um, to consolidate to, to a, a large extent so that they were trying to unify the peninsula uh, with the exception of course of Portugal there on the Iberian Peninsula and they were Aragon and Castile. Uh, Castile was arguably the, mo the more powerful of the two, and uh, Isabella was the queen of, of, of that region. 
and it was contested. Uh, it was contested because she had, I believe it was an uncle who gave birth to a child and she uh, arguably usurped the throne and said that it was hers. And so those who favored the, the infant, um, they, they fought against her. And uh, uh, same thing or similar thing with um, Ferdinand and Aragon. He had half brothers uh, who vied for the throne in Aragon. And so hence there was a sense of precariousness uh, to, to, to consolidate their own thrones and the legitimacy in the eyes of the Spanish people in their own provinces, and uh, also a, a larger desire to uh, unify Spain. What was going on also was the last leg of the reconquest of Spain uh, from the Moors, M-O-O-R-S, and the Reconquista or Reconquest um, entailed a fight in Granada, uh, where they were kicking out the last remaining uh, authoritative figure uh, there who had ruled, you know, arguably off and on one region to, the, to another. Uh, there were, there were uh, variances, uh, but had ruled since 711 when the Moors had taken over uh, what they called Al-Andalus or Southern Spain. And so at any rate, you have a lot of things going on, right? And you also have at this time uh, the, the rat race, as I call it, that was going on in Indonesia and in the Indies. And uh, they, we were trying to, we, I say we, but the, the Europeans uh, were trying to fight their way into the markets. And when I mean fight, I mean literally fight. Uh, so you could look at little islands like Mocha, that we have Mocha of coffee fame named after. Um, it, uh, it was taken over by the Portuguese, then by the Dutch, the Portuguese again, et cetera. And so a lot of these small islands uh, were, were fought for, um, but not formally from the armies of, of these, these burgeoning monarchs that were uh, beginning to, um, to uh, take form in the European countries. Uh, you had, because uh, remember, they, they were coming from the medieval time period, a much more uh, politically uh, decentralized uh, time uh, for Europe. And so when these monarchs are coming up, they're feeling precarious, but they're also gaining some power. And so they, they began writing what I call uh, blank checks uh, to their people, uh, stating that if you could fight your way into these pagan lands, and you could help make money for our country, right? Uh, because uh, for one reason, uh, they, the, the, the royal one-fifth, 20% uh, of everything was taxed by the crowns. And, and not to mention put our flag uh, in, in these lands. If you are willing and able to do that, we will reward you richly. Uh, and mainly the, the, the form of enrichment was by uh, ennoblement, uh, giving noble uh, rights to these people. And in Spain, it was known as Hidalgo uh, status, H-I-D-A-L-G-O. Uh, so to become an Hidalgo was to become like nouveau riche, right? Uh, you, you weren't part of the nobility before, but you literally fought your way into that, um, that part of the spectrum. And so you had some Spaniards who were fighting in Southern Spain against the Moors, and were being granted Hidalgo status. And they were also granted the, the infamous encomienda, uh, E-N-C-O-M-I-E-N-D-A. And the encomienda is you were entitled to uh, the, the forced labor uh, in a certain area that you had conquered or that you had claimed first as a Christian. So notice there were no rights afforded to pagan, to non-Christian, um, lands, according to the, the, the uh, crowns of these European countries, and even at, for a window of time, even the Pope himself. And so uh, a lot is going on. So when they, uh, they form this, you have ostensibly uh, God and his vicar, his representative, the Pope, at the top of this, this chain of being, if you will, that, that, that evolved from the medieval time period. Then you have the crown, and in this case, it's, it's Isabella of Castile primarily and Ferdinand of Aragon trying to unite Spain against the Moors. And then you have the Junta Suprema, 
and the Junta Suprema, right? Uh, they were uh, entitled with the uh, the opportunity to 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 write the laws of of uh, of pagan lands that were formerly conquered by Spain. So the Junta Suprema wrote the laws uh, for the Americas, and of course the laws were supposed to abide by Castilian law. So technically, as far as rights, opportunities, constitutional issues, um, everything. Uh, stemmed from Castile, Spain, all right? And then you also had, of course, the Cortes, which was uh, gaining more and more power for itself. And the Cortes was the parliament uh, back in Spain. And so each province had its own Cortes. So again, you're primarily dealing with the Cortes of Castile uh, here. And they tried to, to intervene and hold the Junta Suprema accountable uh, for the laws they made and what they were doing. Uh, in governing over the Americas. And then you had the Council of the Indies. And the, uh, you know what, I take that back, I apologize. The Council of the Indies wrote the laws for the Americas. I, I got them mixed up with the Junta Suprema. I apologize for that. And so um, then you also had uh, a viceroy or a, a, a vice king, right? A virrey in Spanish. And the, the viceroy uh, came as a representative of the king and queen, um, had power of uh, executive nature uh, to carry out the laws of, of Spanish America and to uh, in charge of the punishment of those who were convicted of crimes, et cetera. And so to a certain extent and in certain contexts, the viceroy had power of life and death. Uh, the, there were only about four viceroys throughout all of the Americas. So the vice royalties were very geographically large areas that each viceroy was responsible for. So you had Rio de la Plata down in South America. You had, of course, the, the vice royalty of, of Mexico uh, and uh, or as they called it, Nueva España or New Spain. And the latter one was uh, was the one that present day U.S. territory fell under. So whether it was in Arizona and in California here in the West or Florida to the East, uh, it was uh, on paper under the Viceroy of Mexico City. All right. Then you also had the Audiencia and the Audiencia were the chief judges who were handpicked from Spain. And they came and they had lesser courts, of course, uh, to, to deal with issues on the regional levels. And the same reasons that we have uh, judges for today uh, they existed to uh, adjudicate or referee disputes and to uh, find people guilty or not guilty of both civic and criminal laws. Um, so, uh, so adjudicate civil laws and to uh, define the, the, the guilt or, or lack thereof or to exonerate uh, those guilty of um, or innocent of, of uh, overstepping uh, criminal laws. Then in addition to that, you had the visitador or the visitor general, and he would come unannounced very often. And a very interesting um, uh, mode of, um, of accountability. He would come unannounced and he would put, uh, it was called the Juez de Residencia. Um, and in the Juez de Residencia, he would put a local Spanish leader under house arrest. Uh, it's J-U-E-Z and then de, de, and then residencia, uh, R-E-S-I-D-E-N-C-I-A. And so uh, under this, uh, anyone who had any uh, grievances against the local Spanish leader uh, could bring them forth an accusation against him, and uh, a judge would decide his fate. Uh, if, if he were to be uh, arrested and sent back to Spain, or to be exonerated of, of charges, or to be punished to whatever degree uh, you had the visitor general. And then over regions, they had governors, right? Uh, gobernadores, and uh, they're very similar to the English American uh, tradition of governors. Uh, matter of fact, we borrowed the term from them. Uh, the corregidores, the corregidores were a hated group of people. Uh, they would come in as, as representatives of the crown to the local city councils, all right, uh, which were known as cabildos or ayuntamientos. I know a lot of Spanish terms today, 
uh, and the corregidores would, uh, they would demand uh, taxes and they would demand tribute and tribute, right? Being subject to the king if you were a part of a subjugated population. So hence the Native Americans, right? And uh, an unassimilated Native American tribe living in its own village, in its own town or city. Uh, you were to have special tribute that you paid to the crown. Oftentimes it was in the form of physical labor uh, to build a cathedral, to build a bridge, uh, et cetera. So the, and then also the corregidores, uh, they uh, exercise veto powers over the city councils. All right. And so then you had the, uh, the mayors that we get the term mayor after, alcaldes mayores. And um, they sometimes were actually elected uh, by the local people, those who could vote. Um, and um, yeah, they had a, a mayor type position, an executive type position with the cabildos, with the city councils. And so that seems to have been the, uh, the general hierarchy that the Spanish brought here uh, into uh, the Americas, all right? And then also what's uh, of, of note at this time is uh, in the 1500s, you had the, uh, the mestizaje laws or miscegenation laws. And um, those miscegenation is inter-ethnic sex, basically, inter-ethnic marriage and procreation. And so they made laws by 1519 um, uh, whereby Spaniards could uh, intermarry with Native Americans. But from everything that I've read, it seems like more of a concession than any kind of an enlightened decision on behalf of Spain. Uh, when you look at the demographics, most of the Spaniards that came were single or married men who came without their wives. And they spent long periods of time, some in many cases, the, the rest of their lives here in the Americas. And so they, uh, it was statistically predictable that they would end up uh, getting with uh, indigenous, they call them indigenous, uh, Native American women. And so they okayed that and they wanted them to be formally, uh, you know, recognized by the governments and formally recognized by the Catholic Church in, in marriage. And, uh, but they formed a chart, right? Uh, which today, you know, it just doesn't look very egalitarian. So look at this, right? A Spaniard with an India is a mestizo, the child thereof, right, is a mestizo. So, so demographically, most Latin American countries to this day are, are mestizo um, ethnically, right? Uh, they have both Spanish uh, or European and uh, Native American blood. And uh, uh, a writer in the 1970s used this term, and it's kind of has stuck ever since, a pigmentocracy, uh, kind of a, um, a hierarchy based upon the pigment of your skin, the color of your skin, because the Spaniards were proud of the fact uh, and differentiated themselves aesthetically uh, that they were lighter skinned than the Native Americans that they came in uh, to conquer and to cohabit with. And so, uh, you know, just the numbers alone, the Spaniards were more, much more likely uh, to intermarry with the indigenous population than will be the English, the Dutch, uh, for sure, okay? The French did as well as the Spanish, but just the numbers aren't there, uh, as you see here. So you have that, right? So at the top of that chain are those from the Iberian Peninsula or from, from Spain and Portugal. Uh, known as peninsulares. And like I said, they literally had edicts calling for cleanness of blood uh, for those settlers who came in and in, and in certain cases for, uh, for those to, to be given certain positions in leadership. And uh, again, you have the variable of different leaders. Different leaders were different um, in their approach uh, to cohabitation. So you have, you know, if you wanted to look up biographies, you have Ferdinand and Isabella, um, you have uh, uh, Carlos the, the, the fifth or Charles the fifth, you have um, uh, very famously uh, Philip the second, and the list goes on and on. And so they are all different in their approaches uh, to how they ran uh, this basic administration. 
The Creoles or the Criollos uh, were those of two Spanish parents, but born in the Americas. And they weren't always given the same opportunities as the Peninsulares. Uh, oftentimes their way up the chain uh, constituted the military or the church uh, to become a friar, a monk, um, or a priest in the Catholic church, or to become a, a soldier. Then you had, of course, the majority who were mestizos, right, uh, um, Native American and Spanish. And oftentimes uh, in, in books, uh, by the way, I would recommend um, a, a gentleman named J.H. Eliot. Uh, his books on this topic are incredible. Uh, he compares English and Spanish colonization, uh, just really, really good uh, historian uh, on this topic. And so, uh, and then of course you have the Native Americans and the African Americans, uh, because they are going to, uh, especially into South America and into Mexico, uh, the Spanish are gonna engage in the slave trade and bring in a lot of slaves. And, and also not to mention, many of them will be brought into the Spanish Caribbean, all right? And so uh, you, there were ways out though, um, uh, like with the mestizos, right? The argument was is that the crumbs were allowed to fall off the table. So the big money makers, right, according to the consulado, uh, which was in charge of, of the mercantilist economy uh, back in Spain, uh, you, uh, if you were involved in a big money making enterprise like sugar, cocoa, tobacco, uh, slavery, uh, you had to have the right papers, uh, the right papers and the right connections to obtain those papers. And oftentimes you were a peninsular, uh, maybe a criollo uh, in obtaining those rights to do that for a living. But at the local levels, right? And the local mercados or markets, uh, they kind of let things be and, and didn't enforce their mercantilist restrictions as well um, at the local level. And so mestizos and others uh, oftentimes could engage in a trade and either become artisans uh, skilled workers. And when they did, they kind of formed uh, guilds, right? A G-U-I-L-D, <clears throat> like a medieval, like a union, like a labor union. They were known as confradias, C-O-N-F-R-A-D-I-A. -A. And, um, and so they, they, they fought for their own rights uh, to, to be able to, like I said, kind of proverbially uh, eat the crumbs off the table. And then, um, also, if you engaged in some type of meritorious act, uh, you saved someone's kid from drowning, a nobleman's, uh, you, you fought well in battle, et cetera, they could grant you a gracias al sacar note. And this note gave you a certificate whereby you were to be treated higher up the chain, uh, perhaps as a criollo or even as a peninsular, as a, a most generically from what I've seen on those certificates, they would say um, uh, an, an Espanol, a Spaniard. And so you could be Native American and win on paper the right to be treated as a Spaniard uh, if you were to engage in some type of act that was publicly recognized uh, by the uh, establishment. Then with the economic dimensions, you have the uh, haciendas or the plantations, right? So the hacendados, uh, were those who led them. And oftentimes, again, because land was allotted by the governors, uh, you see here in like in Southern California, for instance, just a couple last names, the Verdugos, the Nietos, own most of the land around Los Angeles, uh, just a handful of men. So the Asandados were wealthy. Uh, they tried to uh, get around where they would have a market. So hence the pueblos or the cities or towns, right? And uh, you also had the mining barons because in Bolivia, in Peru, and in Mexico, uh, you had mines and silver and gold were found therein in very large quantities. And so they made a lot of money, uh, needless to say. And then also uh, within Comienda is you had um, Hidalgos, right? Uh, men who, um, who obtained an encomienda, right? And that was largely through fighting. And an example of that, right, of course, the most famous arguably is Hernando Cortez, right? 
the guy who took the Aztec Empire, uh, Mexico City, uh, from 1519 to 1521. He was granted uh, Hidalgo and then even higher than that status and uh, granted lots of encomiendas, lots of lands, etc. So you had the, the self-styled conquerors, the conquistadores, who came. And oftentimes, you, 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 know, you don't want to simplify it too much, but some have made the argument that there's a pattern that a lot of conquistadores were the second and third and fourth sons of Hidalgos back in Spain. And so the argument is, right, is they saw their father improve their family's lot by fighting against the Moors back in Spain. And so they continued their dad's tradition. And why not the first son? Because um, under uh, the laws of primogenitor, uh, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the term in Spanish, uh, but el, um, el hijo mayor, right? Oh, they were called mayorascos, um, M-A-Y-O-R, um, A-Z, G-O-S, I think, mayorascos. So the, the hijo mayor, the oldest son, uh, obtained everything from dad. And so the second, third, and fourth sons, right? They saw their dad give them a better life. And they wanted to uh, emulate that. They got a better taste of life. And so they, they felt they had to come and conquer and do it on their own. Then after uh, a lot of the, the fighting of the 1520s and 1530s against the Aztec and the Inca, uh, my, uh, the Inca empires, then you had people also that contended, okay, well, there aren't, uh, you know, in my area, you know, large, you know, uh, Native American confederacies and empires to fight against, but there's a lot of land that's not claimed by these people. So like in South America, in the Pampas region of, of Argentina, etc. And, and of course, here in the US, right, uh, going into uh, Pimaria Alta, which was the name for Arizona, or New Mexico, etc. They would go forward, right, like Adelante, they would go these Adelantados, uh, would go forward, claim pagan lands, and be granted kind of governor status uh, as adelantados going forward and claiming pagan lands. And then, of course, you could get sedulous from the governor, and those granted you opportunities that were economic and political in nature, as well as social, uh, a grant of nobility, etc. And so um, all of that comes into play here. The caballeros, were a higher rank of nobility back in Spain, and they felt threatened by the Hidalgos. Uh, these, uh, they, they looked at them as parvenus, right? Uh, P-A-R-V-E-N-U. Uh, and a parvenu is like uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, right? Uh, someone who was seen as not having any status in society and suddenly gets lucky, right? And suddenly comes upon a lot of wealth and entitlement, et cetera. So there was a sense of jealousy of seeing Hidalgos like Hernando Cortez uh, rise up so quickly after uh, the fall of the Aztec Empire. And then, of course, you had rivalry between the Peninsulares, who were from Spain and getting a lot of the, the lion's share of opportunities and offices, and the Criollos, who contended that we're just as Spanish as you are. We just happen to have been born in the Americas. And their expectations were high, because oftentimes those who came as family units and had connections, uh, 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 had Criollo sons. And so they were born, uh, you know, with a, a bit of a sense of entitlement. And so, um, and then uh, soldiers versus clergy and merchants versus artisans. I'll, I won't get into that right now. But look at this map here. You see a map of present US territory uh, uh, claimed by adelantados, by men who went forward and claimed, right, uh, that land for Castile or for Spain. So in 1540, uh, the southeast was claimed by Hernando de Soto. He went up the Mississippi. Uh, some claim that he went even as high as West Virginia and Tennessee and claimed that land for Spain. Uh, he fought with his own men and he fought with all the tribes around him. Very conflict-laden uh, narrative of, of de Soto, and he didn't make the trip. He ended up dying himself, and his body was thrown in the Mississippi River. In the Southwest, uh, Vasquez de Coronado 
was looking for the seven cities of Kivira, uh, the seven cities of gold, uh, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A, uh, were these infamous cities that were told to him, right, uh, that existed. And of course, he never found them uh, to his disgust. But he, he discovered, uh, discovered as a European, um, the, uh, the Grand Canyon and uh, went up as high as the, the present Midwest. And so uh, that land was claimed from his entrada, as it was called, his entrance, his formal entrance into that land. And then, of course, you had Cabrillo, who himself, I think, was a Portuguese man uh, uh, hired by the Spanish. And he went up the, the coast of California and claimed uh, Upper as opposed to Baja, California uh, in 1540. And so uh, he himself didn't make it through the trip either. And then in 1565, uh, Florida was established by uh, Pedro Menendez de Avila. And, um, you know, he found a, um, a group of, of, of uh, French Huguenot or French Protestant uh, settlers there and had them wiped out and contended against the Appalachian and other powerful Native American tribes there in Florida. And before him, right, famously Ponce de Leon looking for the Fountain of Youth uh, in, in the 15 teens, or he was, he was given the approval as early as 1511. And then uh, Pedro de Narvaez, Narvaez tried it in about 1528, and they were uh, attacked uh, fiercely by the Native Americans of Florida. And that's where you get the story of Cabeza de Vaca and his famous voyages, right? A very, very, uh, it was a, a bestseller, if you will, back in Europe. And that began in about 1528, um, his, his uh, very dramatic uh, life story. Uh, from there. He was enslaved uh, and uh, served as a medicine man and uh, eventually gained his freedom. And um, anyway, it's a very interesting story. Then 1599, uh, Don Juan de Oñate went forward into New Mexico and claimed it for Spain. And I would say uh, subjectively as your instructor, if someone came to me, uh, one of my instructors, had come to me and told me, I want you to adhere to the black legend. So hence, I want the narrative of everything you write to be incriminating against the Spanish. I want them to look like their society was intolerant, was inequitable, uh, was religiously fanatical. Um, I would, and, and, but it has to be in US territory, right? Not in New Mexico or Central or South America. I subjectively would choose New Mexico. Lots and lots of conflict, and lots of manipulation and power plays and, and friction and uh, inequity uh, there in New Mexico. Uh, an interesting book on it is When Jesus Came, The Corn, the corn Mothers Went Away uh, by a, a gentleman named Gutierrez. Uh, that book is really uh, informative on, on New Mexico. And then in 1769, but it didn't, they didn't come until the, the mid 1770s. But uh, as that year, uh, permission was given for the famous sacred expedition. And the sacred expedition, right, was uh, at least threefold. Uh, you had the clergy, and not the formal clergy, but the, the friars, right, the Franciscan friars, the Franciscan order. Uh, they came up for missions. Then you also had, of course, the soldiers, and they were to, um, to build the forts, right, known as the Presidios, to protect the missionaries. And then you had uh, uh, lay leaders who were to form the pueblos or the cities or towns. And as you see to this day, Los Angeles, San Francisco, a lot of cities in California have Spanish names uh, from this time and from the time uh, prior to this uh, under a guy named Sebastian Vizcaino, uh, V-I-Z-C-A-I-N-O. He named a lot of the, of the cities in California after Cabrillo. So then you have your pueblos and then of course you also have your nearby haciendas 
right? And they're asendados, leaders thereof. And so in California, it became very pastoral, uh, very uh, connected to cattle, right? Ranching and the hides, uh, the cattle hide uh, industry. So any basic questions so far? This is just kind of a rundown. Is someone more, you know, expert in this than I could go hours and hours just on the basics of Spanish colonization? It, it's very intriguing. Uh, by far one of my favorite topics for sure. All right. So now moving, uh, what I want to do is I want to stop sharing this. All right. And I want to share. Oh, no, no, not that. I'm sorry. Shoot. I want to share. Uh, the handout. I don't know if you've had a chance yet to look at it. Shoot. Where is the handout? Let's see if I'm able to do this to open it up before your eyes here. Okay, can you see that? Is that okay? Okay, good. All right, and so with number one, right? I wrote number one tongue in cheek. Okay, uh, that. I'm it, sorry, it, I can't it, see. It's anything. Actually, oh, sorry, it's actually still opening. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not open yet. Let me try again, and see if it's open now. Yes. How's that? Okay, good. Thank you. All right, and so um, here with Columbus, right? Is I contend, and by all means, like I've said before, I don't necessarily believe some of these that I put together, all right? I find it just to be thought-provoking from a book that I read or from a professor I sat under. So this is from the book Toward the Setting Sun by David Boyle, and I run with it, right, as if it were me writing it and stating, you know what? People like Columbus had their back to the wall. They had very limited economic opportunities back, and he was in Genoa, right? Back, back in Europe, in his case, back in Italy. And so you have these, these merchants who the, the term bank literally comes from the, the Italian word bench. Uh, they would sit at a bench with a long line, right, of people. They would tell one applicant after another, why do I want to hire you? What, what do you have to offer? And according to this book, right, the shrewdest answer to have was to say, I will do anything you want to bring returns on your investments, right? I'm willing to play the game. So let's say they tell you, all right, we want you to go to Indonesia. We want you to take over one of the islands and grow coffee. You have a certain allotted time to do it. And we want a certain return on our investment by this amount of time or else. What if they told you to go to, uh, you know, Lomboco or Luanda, somewhere on the Ivory Coast, Elmina, and gather about purchase about 300 slaves and bring them to the Spanish Caribbean. Again, if you wanted to improve your lot and the lot of your family, you said, yes, sir. How many? When do you want it? And you would play that ruthless game, right? I call it like the opening, the barbaric beginnings of capitalism, right? Coming from these mercantilist European countries where they're opening things up to virtually anybody who's willing to risk life and limb, but who doesn't necessarily have the capital to begin. So Columbus and others, they didn't have the capital oftentimes to provide more than a ship, much less soldiers, the money to purchase the slaves, et cetera. They were at the mercy, arguably, of their creditors, of their lenders who provided that type of capital. And so hence, that's exactly what Columbus does. He purchases slaves. He fights at Chios in the Mediterranean and almost loses his life there for, for mere commodities. 
And his letter, right? There's a primary source book called Major Problems in American History. And it has a letter from Columbus uh, to King Ferdinand of Aragon. And boy, does it sound callous. He begins boasting about all the resources that he finds in the Caribbean. And time and again, he tells how timid the Native Americans in his esteem, and by his perception, seem to be. And he tells them, do you want me to take some of them as slaves? If so, how many? Tell me and it's done. So very, very callous, right? Very, very Machiavellian. But he owes Ferdinand money, and the return on his investment. Ferdinand was not too uh, enthusiastic about his offer to begin with. He mainly had to go through Isabella and appeal to her, uh, allegedly appeal to her uh, religious zeal and claiming that he would spread the gospel anywhere he went and make Christians of people in foreign lands. And so that's exactly what he does. So, of course, right, today, Columbus Day is a dark day. He engaged, because by the way, when they did fight, oh my goodness, there's a gentleman named Las Casas who wrote about how they fought. And according, if Las Casas can be believed, they, they fought to wipe out their Native American enemies to the last man. They certainly wanted Native Americans with whom they were on good terms to assimilate to things Christian or Catholic. And so hence, you could see why Columbus Day today is a dark day. But David Boyle says, well, you got to empathize with this guy. His back was to the wall. Look how hard his father worked and couldn't just make it to even a comfortable level. Of, of economic being. So he had to. He had to play the game. It was a different time. By all means, tell me what you think in your evaluation. So make sure that you catch that in your analysis, right, on what's being stated and an example of how it's being supported. And then tell me in your evaluation, you know, by all means, tear into that argument. Should you choose number one? Number two. Similarly, it's, it's, it's sympathetic to Spain, as you see here in the title. Spain enslaved by the prejudices of her time. So you see here, Spain's imposition of religion upon Native Americans was ethnocentric, arrogantly centered around their own culture and worldview, and harsh by today's standards. However, imposing contemporary standards about tolerance on the 16th century Spaniards is not logical nor fair. They had yet to an, experience the scientific revolution that taught them to empirically go after information rather than fanatically adhere to beliefs without any type of, of rational and uh, inductive or deductive investigation. The Enlightenment spoke of tolerance, right? Human rights. But the Enlightenment wasn't until the 1740s long before all this happened. Classical liberalism spoke about individual autonomy and how, hey, I'm Catholic, but you're not. That's okay. We could coexist, right? John Stuart Mill. Well, when did John Stuart Mill and the classical liberals gain a lot of vogue throughout the Western world? In the 1800s, long after this happened. So hence, they didn't know any better. They were taught black and white. They were taught things in a very Manichaean manner, uh, M-A-N-I-C-H-E-A-N. And Manichaean, right, is that you don't see the, all the shades of gray 
in the complexity of issues, you see things as very black and white, right or wrong. So hence, I think of Hernando Cortez. According to Castillo, a guy named Castillo, C-A-S-T-I-L-L-O, he was a conquistador who fought with and for Cortez in Mexico. And he wrote a, uh, a famous book on what happened and in his eyes, how it happened. And he paints a picture of almost a bromance between Cortez and Moctezuma II of the Aztec Empire. About the same age, kind of refined in their manners, very charming, both of them. And they got along very well. He says, until Moctezuma II brought Cortez into his temple of which which Pultoli, and please don't ask me to spell that one. Which Pultoli, you know, in the pantheon of Native American gods, oftentimes there's a good and an evil twin, which Pultoli was the evil twin, even according to them. He was their war god. And they sacrificed people to him, right? Didn't just sacrifice and pulling out their hearts, but he also, right, um, they also uh, ate of their bodies afterward, uh, believing that they were imbibing the, the, the good qualities of the sacrament uh, in doing that. So at any rate, they, um, <clears throat> they go into, the, into this temple, and of all Christian symbols, right, what is the symbol, the key symbol of which Pultoli? The serpent. And of course, in Judeo-Christianity, the serpent is the sign of the devil. And Cortez tells him, basically a loose paraphrase here, Moctezuma, you seem like such a reasonable, refined man. Certainly you know that these aren't true gods, but that this comes from the devil. Let me put a cross up in this temple and a portrait to the Virgin Mary. And the evil spirits will leave it, and good will come to your kingdom. Well, clearly, Moctezuma II, and what the Spaniards called his papas, his religious leaders, uh, took great umbrage to that. They were greatly offended. And thus began this spiral of misunderstandings and, and friction that would culminate in an all-out brutal war between the Spaniards and the Aztec. If you'll indulge me one more, the, um, the Franciscans who came into New Mexico, uh, there was a fertility cult amongst the, the Navajo whereby they would engage in sexual activities during their religious ceremonies. Uh, <clears throat> So you could only imagine the, the, the Spanish Catholics, right? They stated that this was of the devil. And, uh, and they began really, really um, oppressing the Navajo people and uh, not allowing them to practice their own religion. And then there's a guy in California who shot a crow uh, near San Diego. They were waiting, the natives were waiting for a sign in their diplomacy with the Spaniards for a crow to screech out a certain message that their shaman alone could understand. And when the crow began crowing, one of the Spaniards shot it and did the sign of the cross, genuflected and said that was the devil. <laughs> and so you have a myriad of cases as such uh, with this cultural misunderstanding, right? So at any rate, the Spaniards, to them, right? There's heaven and hell and purgatory uh, awaiting everyone after death. And they had been held responsible by their vicar, their pope, that they were to be held responsible for the salvation or damnation of the people under their care. How much more the Franciscans, the Augustinians, and the Jesuit monks who uh, formed the missions. And that's why, like in California, 
uh, when Native Americans ran away from the missions, the Spaniards sent their, uh, their soldiers to capture them and forcefully bring them back because they felt like they would, they would resort, they would revert back to their pagan ways and go to hell if they didn't. So the Spaniards didn't know any better. They were caught up in their own time period. They were caught up in their own religious worldview. With number two, okay? So check out the details there. And then from J.H. Eliot's books, Spain as a justifiable anti-model on number three. That yes, according to number three, they do deserve to be depicted in history books as an anti-model. Because look how inequitable and hierarchical their society was. And we went over a lot of that data already. Limited economic opportunities, limited political opportunities, ruled by a Spanish elite. There's the pigmentocracy chart. Number four is good old deflection. Saying, okay, the Spaniards were inequitable. Their society was. But was that unique? Was it any better in English Virginia? And of course, that's meant to be a rhetorical question, right? The answer is within the question is the answer to that is no. The English, especially in Virginia, were not any better. And remember, the standards we're using are egalitarianism and democracy. The things were not egalitarian, putting people on equal footing, and they were not democratic in English Virginia. And you have facts to back that up to show, to suggest that Virginia was an archaic oligarchy ruled by the gentry class at the expense of virtually everyone else. So I'm wanting to make sure I have everyone's names. Okay, let's see here. So if you don't mind, I want to stop sharing. And I want to show just at the end here, the test. And firstly, see if there's something that I did not cover. How about number seven? Which of the following was not arguably an historical contribution by the Spanish to the Americas? A monotheistic belief in the Christian God? Yes. Elements of law we have borrowed from Rome and Germanic sources? Yes. Modern notions of private ownership of property and of urban development? Yes. Elements of Hispanic culture? Absolutely. So remember, this is like organic history or functional history. You're not looking at good guys and bad guys like conflict history does. You're not engaging in court history where you're, where you're particularly praising the winners. You're just simply trying to describe of how we got to where we are today. What contributions were made by certain demographics. In this case, what contributions were made, good or bad, by the Spaniards. But look at D, they had to teach Native American tribes how to cultivate the land? No, of course not. The Native Americans, as you saw in our first topic, had engaged in the Neolithic Revolution, the, the New Stone Toll 
farming revolution by 8,000 BC in certain just areas, but certainly long before 1492. There weren't a lot of areas in present US that had not yet experienced the agricultural revolution. California actually was one of them with a possible exception of the Santa Barbara tribe, the Chumash. And some of these I'm going to say for the when we cover it for the test. So I'll have something to teach you for the test. Okay, if that's okay. But what about Las Casas? His brief relation of the destruction of the Indies, openly sympathized with Native Americans, whom he often labeled as meek sheep. Hence, his history arguably was intended to sway crown policy and public opinion toward legislative protection of Native American rights. That is true. Okay, Bartolome de las Casas supposedly had an epiphany when he sat under a guy named Montesinos on the island of Española during mass. And Montesinos told his contemporaries, the way you are treating the Native Americans is tantamount to a mortal sin. You must repent. So he gave up his encomienda. He and his father had intellectual ties to the initial conquistadores. He gave that up, joined the clergy, and engaged in debates with a guy named Sepulveda back in Spain, fighting for the rights of Native Americans and to be treated well. Sepulveda wanted holy war to be declared against them. So I have a, a Spanish literature book from years ago. My Spanish is rusty, but at any rate in it, it's, it's incredible. Um, it has his exact writings uh, in the original Spanish and it, it, he he likens the, the Spaniards to tigers and wolves. And he depicts the Native Americans as ovejas mansas, uh, as I say, meek sheep. And says, and calls the Spaniards those who call themselves Spaniards. He also gives us an instance of the Cholulan Massacre, C-H-O-L-U-L-A-N, at Cholula, near Mexico City. Uh, feel free to look into that. He gives details of the Spaniards' uh, brutality and how they fought in the Caribbean. Sagoon. This guy was a priest, and I'm, I think I'm going to wait on him, if you don't mind, for the week of the test. I'll go over him. As well as Junipero Serra. As I mentioned in 13, Don Juan de Oñate was subjectively mentioned in class as a perfect case challenging the Black legend, and that multiculturalism and democracy were highly respected and frequently practiced in his Spanish New Mexico. No way. I would actually choose to adhere to the black legend if I wrote on him personally. Areas that were claimed, you're looking for the one that doesn't fit. Did I say anything about the Northeast section of the US? No. So that'd be the one that doesn't fit, right? Ponce de Leon tried to claim Florida, not Massachusetts.
And then textbook questions I'll go over for the test. So yeah, if you don't mind, I wanna leave a little bit for the test. So we're not just going over these again or haven't already done so. So remember for test one, I'm gonna go through these questions when you finish assignment number four. So are there any questions you guys? Yeah. Uh, you said there is a PowerPoint presentation where I don't find it. Where do I find that? Uh, it'll be under modules. Uh, I don't I don't have it there yet. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I will put that up very shortly though. Okay. I'll put that up tonight. Yeah, sure. But yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, as I need the I needed the reminder to put that up. And my question isn't a question meant to pressure you or anything. Um, before I do the writing for the next assignment, I just wanted to um, get feedback on the first one. So will those be graded before the second um, written thing is due? Oh, goodness. Let's see here. I don't want to make a promise that I can't keep. So let me look at the schedule. Um, let's see here. Start. So Native Americans were are due... Okay, yeah, so the, the first one is due tomorrow night, right? Mm -hmm. And the second one is due next Tuesday, the 5th. Yeah, I'll have the first one done before then. Oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure because I, I don't want to keep writing them wrong if, no, exactly. if I wrote the first one wrong, so. Yeah, I completely okay. understand. And that is that is absolutely reasonable uh, to, to be able to uh, expect that. Okay, thank uh, you. Before you turn in the second assignment to see how you did on the first one. Absolutely. Okay. And um, uh, so I, I started a little late yesterday. Yes. Uh, the first, uh, the recording, will you, would you please uh, upload uh, post it? Post that? For, yeah, so I can watch it before I write my response for the Absolutely. first one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'll put that also. Yeah, to be honest, I I, I lack the uh, the technical savvy to post them myself, and so I, I have my wife do them for me. <laughs> it's no excuse, but that's why it's not on there yet. But I will I will have her uh, get on that as soon as possible. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure, you guys. That's all I have. If you don't have any other questions, I wish we could oh, meet in person. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I just have one question pertaining to um, the Zoom meetings. Are um, is it any different, or is like the topic somewhat the same? What you discuss on Tuesdays and Wednesdays? So I'm sorry. I miss could Tuesdays. You, could, Michael, could you ask that again? I'm sorry. Yes. So um, regarding the Zoom meetings, the information that you present on both Tuesday and Wednesday are they both similar meetings discussing the same topic, or are they just substantially different from each other? Yes, they're different. Yeah. Okay. Just make so, sure. Yeah, I miss so, Tuesdays. Uh, so no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Each each Zoom meeting is for a specific topic, a, a okay. different one. So yeah. So Tuesdays uh, we covered um, uh, we covered Native Americans, and today we're covering the Spanish. Perfect. And so uh, next Tuesday we'll cover Spanish. Or I'm sorry, Southern colonization, and the okay. one after that Northern colonization. So yeah, each meeting. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, each meeting will uh, revolve around a different assignment. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I enjoy, I, no pressure on the others, but I enjoy being able to see you. And so those of you who allow me to do that, it gives me a little bit of a semblance of, of being back in class. I love it. And not like you're just talking to yourself. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So thank you. All awesome. right. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I hope to see you Tuesday. Yeah. See you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day.